Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Oncology Brothers podcast. I'm Rahul Gosain, here with my brother and co-host, Rohit Gosain. Today, we're discussing yet another recent FDA approval in the world of cancer. Arguably, role of immunotherapy in MSI high or MMR deficient has been one of the most promising advances we've seen in cancer. From bucket approval of pembrolizumab in this space, with a request to do even better, which takes us to our study today, Checkmate 8HW, where we have seen dual checkpoint inhibitors focusing in metastatic colorectal cancer. To help us unpack this study and touch on key findings, we're joined by Dr. Nicholas Hornstein, HGI medical oncologist from Northwell Health. Nick, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to discuss what is a very impactful approval and study. Indeed, Nick. Let's dive right in. Before we touch on the study design and its findings, a bit of the background here. What does it mean to be MSI high? And what does the testing entail? Are we relying on IHC or NGS? And how prevalent MSI is in metastatic colorectal cancer? So microsatellite high colon cancer is somewhere between 3 and 5% of metastatic colorectal cancer. You see it more in stage 2 and 3 colon cancers as high as 15 to 20%. Um, in terms of our ability to detect it, there's a few different ways. The first line of defense is using immunohistochemistry, where we can look for the proteins that are associated with the MSI high phenotype. So things like MSH2, PMS2, MLH1, so on and so forth. But IHC doesn't capture everything, even though it might pick up something along 95% of MSI high colorectal cancer. There's still that 5% of patients that might slip through the cracks and need more nuanced methodology to detect their MSI high status. For those patients, we rely usually on PCR, which can pick it up. These patients are usually detected amongst those that have Lynch syndrome. Those tend to be the ones where you miss it on IHC. You also mentioned next generation sequencing. I'm a big fan of NGS. And it comes into play here as well, where you have an even more sensitive tool to pick up on MSI high. Appreciate you laying that foundation, Nick. We know these particular tumors are highly immunogenic. As a result, we have seen pembrolizumab as a bucket approval, Rahul, as you mentioned earlier. But now for colorectal cancer, we have approval of nivolumab, ipilimumab, dual checkpoint inhibitors based off of Checkmate 8HW. Nick, could you please walk us through the study design and endpoints? Yeah, so Checkmate 8HW is a fantastic study. And if you remember back to Checkmate 142, I think that's the right one, around July 2018, this was the first evidence that dual checkpoint inhibitors might be beneficial in MSI high metastatic colorectal cancer. That was a phase two study, about 80 patients that received the combination of nivolumab and nipolimumab. But being a single arm study, even though it led to an approval, it didn't really give the evidence many wanted to see to encourage use in this setting, especially when we know there might be some more toxicity with adding on a second checkpoint inhibitor. So in comes Checkmate 8HW, and this is, in my mind, a really beautiful study. So this is two main arms that was set up as Ipinevo versus Nivolumab, and then Ipinevo versus chemotherapy. So you get a nice separation of components from Nivolumab and Ipilimumab, and you're able to kind of tell, hey, is this really working better than one alone. The ability to look at this in the randomization is nice, and the primary endpoint was progression-free survival. So looking at these treatment arms, you have the nivolumab plus ipilimumab arm, which was 240 milligrams nivolumab and one mg per kg ipilimumab. Important to point out, because in GI medical oncology, we also see three mg per kg of ipilimumab and HCC, which is not the case here, versus chemotherapy in the first-line setting. The second arm of this study with nivolumab plus ipilimumab, 240 milligram and one mg per kg during the first four treatments versus nivolumab alone was in all lines. There are some differences. You can't directly compare apples to apples, so to speak, across them just because of that slight difference in the patient population. All patients were MSI high with the vast majority of them uh, identified by a central board. And that's kind of the background of the study. You know, one thing I love about this approach, we've seen this with stride regimen and hepatocellular carcinoma. We also saw this with Nadina trial and melanoma as use of limited CTLA-4 and then continuing on with the PD-1 inhibitor. This way, we're getting the benefit of dual checkpoint inhibition, but also limiting the side effects. And one thing that you point out, Nick, 
the dose of Ipi here is one milligram per kilogram. This is different than recent approval of Ipi Nevo in HCC, where the dose of Ipi is three milligrams per kilogram. Okay, coming back to colorectal cancer. So Ipi Nevo combination was approved because this was indeed a positive study. Nick, what did the study show? Yeah, so this study, and I think what you're showing is the progression-free survival of nevo Ipi versus Nevo, which yeah. is a great curve, but when we look at nevo Ipi versus chemo, that's a jaw-dropping PFS curve. What this study showed is giving patients time-limited ipilimumab, which is only four treatments over the first four treatment cycles, had a, a significant benefit to progression-free survival. The median progression-free survival, something like 54 months versus 18 months, nevo ipi versus nevo alone, generating a hazard ratio of 0.64, is a pretty significant benefit based on some of the earlier studies. The jury was kind of out. Is it worth it to add this additional agent? And I, I think with this evidence, a lot of people are probably weighing towards a yes. This does seem like for most patients coming in with MSI high, metastatic, or locally advanced unresectable colon cancer, there is a benefit there. And I, I do think it's worth mentioning that second part. So it's not just patients who have gross metastatic disease that might benefit from the study. It's also those where they just have clearly unresectable disease. But either way, it seems like there is a significant progression-free survival benefit here. Right. To what you mentioned, uh, Nick, with regards to comparison to chemotherapy, that was certainly jaw-dropping. We had a chance to discuss this back from GI ASCO 2024 with Dr. Pamela Coons, and that was impressive. Everyone was waiting for this Nevo IPI being compared to Nevo, and Dr. Karana and you pointed out how different this is, where the combination is certainly playing a bigger role. Though we have used this combination with CTLA-4 in other disease sites as a community oncologist. We've seen that in kidney cancer, melanomas, and others. This does not come without toxicity. There is significant toxicity associated with it. Nick, could you please point out important side effects that we have seen with the combination? Yeah, with the combination of volumab, ipilimumab, as you mentioned, this is seen in multiple tumor types, similar dosing similar side effects. The main side effects in terms of greater than 20% across patients, things like fatigue, diarrhea, itching, abdominal pain, and nausea. We have to keep in mind the things we really worry about for our patients. The things that keep me up at night where if a patient calls me, I say, okay, we need to go to the ED or we need to start some steroids or some other interventions. We're talking about things like pneumonitis, colitis, and and honestly, sometimes it's a little hard to cancel on immunotherapy. I say, if you can think of an autoimmune disease, it could happen with this. The other thing I would mention is thyroiditis. Worth keeping in mind, just given the high probability, but we have pretty good treatment for it nowadays, so not as critical. Right, again, we're getting more and more comfortable with these immunotherapy options in our clinic, but keeping these side effects on our radar is very important. The common ones and the rare ones as well, be it neurological side effects. I've seen some encephalitis. I actually have a patient in the hospital right now with that. So these are the things that we have to keep in mind. They're not benign. To the point of grade three, grade four, it's pointed out that about 22% and rather 14% were experienced. Again, in community, we have to manage these effectively. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Given the data in hand, most of your patients are going to get epinevo if they qualify for immunotherapy. Who would you pick single agent Pembro or nivolumab for? You know, that's a really good question. In the last month, I've had a 91-year-old come into my clinic with that metastatic colorectal cancer, and I've had a 26-year-old come into my clinic with MSI colorectal cancer, and both of them got epinevo. So huh. the number of patients that I'm, and this was after a very long conversation about sure. risk benefits. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you're probably expecting me to say the 91 year old got single agent, but I, I would have picked that. Yep. I think a lot of this is based on discussion with the patient going through the risks, benefits and making an informed decision with the patient. Looking at these PFS curves, I think there's a significant benefit to adding on CTLA-4 here. You could make the case that, at least in melanoma, we've demonstrated that there can be a rescue effect adding on CTLA-4 later if you're not seeing the response you want to see up front. I think that's very fair. So I, I am being a little bit uh, uh, in jest here. This was a very special 91-year-old who is still out lifting weights daily in the yard. For our older patient population, more frail, you might want to think about doing single-agent immunotherapy. If a patient is physically fit, robust, and you think they could tolerate having an immune-related adverse event and survive through it while you're treating it, I don't think it's unreasonable to, to reach for CTLA-4 as well, even at advanced age. Absolutely. Nick, you touched on melanoma. Let's take that as an example, because we see some of that here in colorectal cancer as well. 
what if there is that commutation of BRAF V600E and MSI high disease? It's not very common, but you can run into this subset in this patient population. Are you going to rely on immunotherapy? We've also seen data on the BRAF inhibitors here. How would you treat that commutation? I think we have multiple trials out, you know, beacon breakwater. At the end of the day, you're talking about very different toxicity profiles and mechanisms of action. If I have a patient in a critical period, maybe impending organ failure or something that you need to get a response immediately, maybe you do think about using a chemotherapy-based strategy, at least for the start, before you sequence into immunotherapy. I think those patients are hopefully few and far between. My hope is that given the significant benefit with this combination therapy and the stark difference in the side effect profile, I hope to use immunotherapy increasingly. I hope we can discover the way to crack the code on microsatellites at colon cancer and find more benefit there. Absolutely. Can I just reiterate one thing? When it comes to BRAF V600E and MSI high disease, immunotherapy is still very active here because we've seen that if you have an actionable mutation, we shy away from using immunotherapy. But at this time with MSI high disease and BRAF V600E, bringing immunotherapy and BRAF inhibitors, both options are very viable. Yeah. And at, at the end of the day, in terms of the patients that benefit, it's the mutation associated neoantigen load that's going to tell you Right. benefits. People who have weird mutations in proteins will benefit from immunotherapy, and those yes. tend to be the ones that have mismatch, mismatch repair mm -hmm. deficiency. Again, as always, when multiple options are available, patient shared decision making is certainly the key. Nick, I acknowledge you. You are a brave man to be utilizing the dual checkpoint inhibitor <laughs> in a 91-year-old. <laughs> we continue to say that age is a number. Well, we are eagerly awaiting data on the Comet trial, which will be a TESO plus chemo. We still have some drop-off for survival for some of our patients with immunotherapy, be it because of toxicity or some of them being non-responders. Nick, before we close, any final thoughts here? This is a very exciting study, and the hope is that as the years go by and additional studies come out, we learn how to leverage immunotherapy to a greater extent for our patient population, not just for MSI high colorectal cancer patients, but also for MSS. I think we've seen some very promising data in the neoadjuvant setting as well in both MSI high and MSS, and my hope is that we'll continue to see that. There's a lot to think about with MSI high in the adjuvant setting. And hopefully we'll have some guidance on that over the next few months. I totally agree with you here, sir. Since the inception of immunotherapy, its use and responsiveness has been the most incredible story in oncology, where our patients are living much longer. And similar is the case we see with Checkmate HHW for colorectal cancer. Nick, thanks for walking us through the study and its findings. For our listeners, let us go over a quick recap. Today, with Dr. Nicholas Hornstein from Northwell Health, we had a chance to discuss the recent approval of nivolumab and ipilimumab in metastatic colorectal cancer with MSI high disease or MMR deficient disease based off of Checkmate HHW study. This combination showed improved overall response rate and progression-free survival when compared to single-agent nivolumab. Right, I want to bring up the study design up again as the dose of IPI, which was one milligram per kilogram is important and patients received four doses of IPI-NEVO and then they got nivolumab alone. There is a limited exposure of CTLA-4 here. That said, we still have to keep immunotherapy related side effects in mind. Yes, totally agree. Based on this data, this is now yet another treatment option up front that is available for this subset of disease. Thanks for joining us. Make sure to check out our recent FDA approval discussions, conference highlights, and treatment algorithms. We look forward to seeing you in person at ASCO 2025. We are the Oncology Brothers.